how this conflict in Israel is going to influence the funds and weapons that have been sent to Ukraine? Well, what, what's been, it's not going to necessarily affect anything that has been sent already, other than the possibility that some of those weapons may have been diverted to Hamas. We don't know for sure. Uh, the, the problem is the United States has supplied weapons to Ukraine. It supplied weapons to the Palestinian Authority. And it supplied weapons to Afghanistan that it abandoned. So there are at least three possible sources that, uh, that Hamas could uh, access to get uh, those weapons. I know at least with respect to some of the rifles, I'm told by a, a friend who has worked closely with Israel in the past that they believe uh, the firearms came from the Palestinians. So going forward, though, what this means, Ukraine is going to be on the back burner. It is going to be the redheaded stepchild. It's going to be the kid in the family that gets all the hand-me-downs of that. Uh, it's not the first one to eat. It's going to be the last one to eat. So I, I think Ukraine's ability to even sustain its uh, position in this war is going to er er erode pretty dramatically over the next couple of months. How do you see the Russians right now? Are they going to escalate the fight? Well, they've actually already got... They are going on the offensive and have done so over the last week and a half, uh, particularly up in the area of, uh, of the uh, Dievka. Uh, the Russians are surrounding what looks to be upwards of 20,000 uh, Ukrainian troops, getting them in what they call a cauldron, and uh, they are advancing fairly rapidly. So, And Ukraine has no ability to stop them. They don't have the weaponry. Uh, they certainly don't have the vehicles. It seems that the Biden administration already started negotiating with Russians. Is that true? And I I have seen no evidence of it. It uh, I'm I'm not sure what the, you know what they're going to negotiate on. Uh, Russia's position is very clear. They're not giving up any territory. They're not going to give up Kherson, Zaporizhia, uh, or the Donbass, Luhansk, and Donetsk. Uh, and they're probably going to insist upon. Uh, the the Ukrainians vacating as well uh, Crimea. Well, I mean, not Crimea, Odessa. So uh, it's up in the air about Kharkiv. But uh, Odessa, certainly the Russians are going to insist on comes back to them. I'm not sure the United States is willing to make that kind of deal or is even has the power to make that kind of deal without Ukrainian cooperation. Uh Zelensky remains adamant that they're not going to offer any concessions to the Russians, that they're going to push, push the Russians out. He's, you know, he's, he's a, a crack addict using lots of cocaine. It's obviously affecting his judgment. But until he's going to have to be either replaced or eliminated, uh, there's no foundation for any kind of fruitful negotiations that will bring this to an end. Do we have any understanding of what is the Russian tendency toward the western part of Ukraine? Are they going to get a desk uh, <clears throat> that connects the western part of Ukraine to the Black Sea? No, well, the, uh, Russia has no interest in occupying western Ukraine. They recognize that's just, that's just a long-standing problem. You would have a hostile population. Russia would have to take lots of steps, excuse me. My alarm was going off to tell me to make sure I didn't forget you. <laughs> uh, Russia would have to take lots of steps to do, you know, what would be counterinsurgency uh, operations. I, I don't think they have any interest in that. Uh, I think the Dnieper River will be the physical barrier separating uh, Russia from Ukraine. This conflict in Israel, it's a great failure in the intelligence service from the U.S., from Israel. How they couldn't foresee? Well, a, a variety of reasons. Um, one, it starts with the Israelis, particularly their intelligence service uh, and the military tend to be very arrogant. They assume that they're so much better, so superior, that their knowledge is better, that they won't listen if somebody, if, if it's true that the Egyptians came to warn them, they could easily dismiss it and say, no, we, ha we haven't seen that, uh, so it can't be true. If they haven't seen it, then it doesn't exist, even though, you know, the, it sounds like the Egyptians were telling them exactly what was going to happen. Then 
you've got the, the 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 problem that with Hamas as a target. Hamas, my understanding is, uh, doesn't doesn't engage with social media. They're not using computers. They're not using cell phones, text messaging, uh, Instagram, anything, WhatsApp, uh, Signal. Uh, they're not using those kinds of platforms to communicate and plan military operations. They're doing it the old-fashioned way, face-to-face -face meeting, or when they meet uh, with a courier, they pass messages via a courier that's not typed out on a computer, that's handwritten. So that's very difficult to detect unless you ha happen to have a spy inside that network. And it sounds like Israel didn't have a spy inside the Hamas network. The, so that that that's the other sort of source element of the surprise. Uh, the buildup, uh, you know, seeing a bunch of motorcycles gather, see a bunch of pickup trucks gather, that's not necessarily going to set off alarms. And people just could make the assumption, well, yeah, we see it, but what are they going to do? Break through the wall? Well, that's exactly what they did. This conflict in Israel has been going on for <clears throat> years. And yeah. in your opinion, why the international community cannot get a peace agreement between these two nations? They can't live in peace together. Well, uh, the, the, ma the major, I think, roadblock in all of this is the United States. Um, the United States cannot be an honest broker in the process because politically America is beholden uh, to Jewish voters. Uh, Jewish voters rep represent a significant block in American politics, and American politicians, Republican and Democrat, are not of a mind to do anything or take any action which would alienate them. And anybody in the United States that tries to have, let's call it an honest, objective discussion about Israel slash Palestine and the rights of the Palestinians, vice the right of the Jewish people. Oh my goodness, you're going to be uh, accused of everything. And I've noticed even on my blog at Sonar Twenty One, you got some people that accuse me of being that I'm a Jewish activist, that I'm making excuses for Israel, and then I get from the Jews accusing me of being an anti-Semite. So that tells me I must be doing something right because if both of those extremes are attacking me then I know I'm, I'm right down the middle on this. Uh, the, you know, the, this, this goes back to the foundation of the state of Israel and, and Zionism in general. Uh, when the Zionist movement was active prior to 1947, remember you had elements of uh, the, that Jewish movement that were engaged with terrorism. Uh, the Ergun and the Stern gang were, were two of the, the principal ones. And, uh, you know, uh, previous uh, uh, Menachem Begin was, uh, he'd been a member, I think, of Irgun. So you'd had a former terrorist, just like Yasser Arafat, who uh, became part of the ruling uh, elite in Israel. And, you know, when you go back and try to say, okay, who punched who first? Now, now that you have two kids, you'll learn about this as they get older. You know, one will complain that the other one hit them. Well, who was the first one to cause action? Well, the Jews will say it was the Palestinians. The Palestinians will say it was the Jews. And no, about, no amount of reasoning or talking is going to settle that. They are set in their views that the other's responsible, that the other's at fault. Ultimately, the, you know, what, you, what you're going to need is an honest, per, unlike the United States, that maybe Russia, China, uh, with a combination of other countries, India could intervene to provide enough guarantees to either side that uh, the, the Israel could live in a secure border without having to fear being attacked, that its rights as a nation would be acknowledged, and at the same time that the Palestinian people would no longer be held like the Jews were in ghettos in World War II. 
uh, because they have a legitimate beef as well. So it's, you know, there's no easy solution here. Putin stated without resolving the fundamental political issue, the most important of which is the establishment of a sovereign Palestinian state with Eastern Jerusalem right. as its capital. China as well suggests something similar. Well, Jerusalem captured or the Israel captured Jerusalem during the Yom Kippur War, consolidated its control over it. But, you know, if if you've ever been to Jerusalem, uh, it's, it's you know, you've got the Christians, the Jews, and the Muslims, the three great religions. And, you know, uh, there's a very good argument to be made, at least for the old Jerusalem, the city center, that that should be considered an international capital not belonging to anyone, that it would be uh, sort of an independent entity that would be co-ruled with uh, Jews, Muslims, and Christians. I note that uh, in, in the old city where the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is located, a church built upon the site, they claim, where uh, Jesus was crucified, uh, you find that the, the person that holds the key to lock and unlock the front door on that massive structure is the the head imam of the of the mosque there in Jerusalem. Because why? Because none of the other Christian sects trust each other. <laughs> they trust the Muslim more. So there really is a foundation there that you could find a way for Christians, Jews, and Muslims to uh, live together. Uh, but the Israelis, they they have their own internal problems. The the Hasidic Jewish community, some of them are very, very extreme. And, and there's, you know, videos of them spitting on the ground in front of Christians and Muslims. You know, it's, it's, it's entirely disrespectful. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're, they're still within Israel, Jews who want to find an accommodation. So, it, but, but what's, what has to take place right now there's there's going to need to be some outside diplomatic intervention to try to stop this bloodshed because I fully understand the anger of the Israeli public over the, the you know senseless massacre of those uh, young people that were out at that dance festival in the desert. Exactly. You know, there's there is no excuse in any world for the, what Hamas did, the, the killing of innocents, of, of civilians who are unarmed, who are not military personnel, they're not in uniform, they're not carrying guns. Murdering them was a war crime, no different than what the Nazis did to the Jews at Babi Yar, uh, no different than uh, what what was done inside uh, Rwanda uh, to the Tutsis, I believe it was. And so, you know, we've seen We've seen these kinds of heinous uh, murders around the world, and there's no no place to excuse it. Uh, it you know, on the other hand, you know, when Hamas was attacking Israeli military bases and killing Israeli military personnel, you know, that, that's not a war crime. That's that's the price of uh, combat, and uh, it's it's ugly, but it's part of the rules of war. Um, but, you know, at the same token, you've seen, uh, you know, the, the false story planted that Israel, or that the Hamas was beheading uh, 40 uh, Israeli babies. That's that's just a lie. That uh, That's a malicious lie. Uh, on the other hand, you are seeing the bodies of Palestinian children that have been killed in these bombing runs by the Israeli Air Force. And there are images as well of Israeli soldiers taking captured Hamas prisoners, stripping them completely naked, painting numbers on their backs, hog tying their hands and their feet together behind their, you know, behind the back, and then forcing them to lay face down in the, in the dirt. Well, that's a war crime. You know, no, no professional army in the world would allow its soldiers to handle prisoners that way. It is, uh, it, it, it's disgusting. So, and, and again, when Israel does that kind of thing, it loses its moral authority to lecture others. And, but by the same token, 
you know, Hamas didn't didn't do itself any favors either by massacring these civilians. This is like, you know, a pox on both their houses. They they both behave like you know, wild beasts. And that needs to stop. How do you see the attitude, the point of view of the Biden administration toward this conflict in Israel? How are they going to handle it, in your opinion? Badly. Uh, you know, this the idea of sending these uh, this carrier strike group, the Gerald Ford carrier strike group off off the coast of uh, Israel to do what? I mean, the only thing it can do apart from picking up refugees and putting them on board the ship is to launch, to be used to help launch military strikes against Palestinians. Now, the last time the United States did this was in 1983 off the coast of Lebanon, where uh, the civil war in Lebanon was heating up between the Druze, the Christians, and uh, and the Shia Muslims. And Hezbollah was uh, very active in its early days. And the United States started shelling uh, Hezbollah positions in the Bekaa Valley. And, uh, Hezbollah, with Iranian help, um, was, uh, sh should have uh, punched right back. And, and what they did is they hit uh, the Marine barracks. <laughs> and they blew up the U.S. embassy. So it was after that the United States pulled its forces back. Because, you know, short of putting boots on the ground, I mean, that's all that's going to do is exacerbate the situation. Because what makes, what makes right now so dangerous is the Arab and Muslim world is no longer divided like it was two years ago. Even as recently as uh, uh, 2021, uh, before we go into 2022, Saudi Arabia and Iran were at odds. They were fighting a proxy war in Yemen. Uh, Syria was isolated. You had members of the Gulf, uh, Gulf Arabs funding terrorist groups that were attacking uh, Syrian positions. Uh, Turkey uh, was uh, a real problem for uh, Syria as well. Uh, that's all changed, completely changed now. So you've got uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran back at diplomatic relations, exchanging ambassadors. Ending, they ended the war in Yemen. Uh, then on top of it, they've, uh, Syria has been invited back into the Arab League with all, all good standing. And so, you know, you've got unity now uh, among uh, these different states. And, you know, previously Egypt was just, you know, had great animus towards Hamas because of its roots as uh, with uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And if you go back to the Muslim Brotherhood, were the ones who assassinated uh, Anwar Sadat back in the 80s. But, you, you know, Egypt's walking a fine line right now. They're not eager to embrace Hamas, but they know politically they cannot remain silent while Israel is killing women and children with these indiscriminate bombings. And, you know, the, the Israelis argue, well, that's Hamas forcing them to be in there, and it's just the price of war. Well, they can say that, but it doesn't, that's not going to change how the Arab and Muslim in the street reacts. And so if you get to, you're going to reach a critical mass here where uh, the people of Iraq, people of Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Syria, Jordan. They're all going to come together and back the Palestinians. And then Israel is going to be isolated in a way it has not been isolated in almost 60 years. Larry, when it comes to Israel and Palestine, do you see any difference between Republicans and Democrats? Uh, the only difference is there are more Republicans advocating military intervention on behalf of Israel than there are Democrats. You still have a, a small group of Democrats who side with Hamas, uh, AOC, Talib, uh, they're uh, Presley out of Massachusetts, you know, the, what they call the gang, there's six of them. Uh, but beyond that, the, the Democrats are almost as in enthusiastic as the Republicans in trying to figure out how much more military aid we can send to Israel and how much how many 
uh, Palestinians can we kill? Do they not see what was the outcome of sending weapon and funds? It's doubling down on failure. The same policy. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, you, you're assuming that there's a learning curve. I know you've got a, you're a professor. And I know you're accustomed to teaching students and they actually learn as they go along. Not these people. Flat learning curve, just flat. No memory of history. You know, it is, uh, I wrote a piece recently at Sonar 21 reflecting on back in the 1980s, you know, right after the Ayatollah Khomeini had taken over in Iran and had taken a, the students uh, the radical students had taken American diplomats and Marines hostage, and they were held. Well, in during that period that they were being held hostage, Israel started selling weapons, American-made weapons, to Iran. You know, I thought you know, I thought Iran and Israel hated each other, and then in nineteen January of eighty-one, after Reagan took office. Uh, the Israelis approached the U.S. government and got a blessing, a permission to continue selling weapons to uh, Iran. And this was going on during 1983 when Iranian-backed groups were blowing up the U.S. embassy in Beirut and killing Marines and engaged with other terrorist attacks. So you can understand why some, at least in either Iran or Iraq or Egypt or anywhere else, they look at the United States as, you know, a, a complete prostitute who'll do whatever for uh, for money, or in this case, whatever to wield influence. And then during that same period, the United States was uh, supplying weapons to, at, to Iraq. And Iran and Iraq had been at war since 1980. And so here's the United States feeding the conflict on both sides including providing or at least the material that was used to construct chemical weapons in Iraq, all because we wanted to stop Soviet expansion back then. And you know, again, the United States today wants to be at war with Iran. We view Iran as terrible. And I'm not here to argue that you know, Iran has been conducting itself as a model citizen. But again, the, most people in the United States the, the, the majority of the population were not alive in 1953 when the CIA overthrew the government of Mossadegh and the Shah of Iran was ultimately installed and the abuses that that, that uh, he participated in. Um, so there is a context here that Iran was just not mad at us because they hate our freedom or they don't like democracy. No, there's, you know, the you know, United States has some blood on its hands with respect to uh, what's happened. And then really over the last 20 years, there have been several assassinations inside Iran of uh, nuclear scientists. And, you know, that's not being carried out by do domestic dissidents. That's being carried out with the support of foreign intelligence organizations like Israel and the CIA. When you see somebody like Nikki Haley, she is a GOP candidate for the presidential election. On Twitter, she tweeted, finish them. Yeah, these, these are people that have never been in any fight in their life where they've actually had to shed blood and or be responsible for getting others killed. Uh, so, I mean, it's a, she's, she's a deplorable human being. She has no business being anywhere near the seat of power. You know, what, what you need right now is a statesman or a stateswoman, somebody with the judgment to understand we, we need to stop this senseless killing on both sides. And that, you know, to, to pretend that the Palestinians don't have legitimate grievances and that to ignore the history of the United States. When the United States was facing what it viewed as imperial abuse from the Great Britain, we declared independence and fought a revolution and engaged in combat against British troops. So, you know, we were, we were born in that kind of violence, yet we would now accuse anybody else that tried that, like uh, the Palestinians, oh, that they're, they're terrorists. Well, okay, Benjamin Franklin was a terrorist. Thomas Jefferson was a terrorist. John Adams was a terrorist. 
That's how the United Kingdom viewed them. They were terrorists. So whenever you're fighting against an established order, uh, you know, the easiest way to try one of the one of the techniques to try to defeat it, counter it is just to accuse them of being terrorists, enemies of the state. You know, we saw that during the Soviet Union with dissidents who protested the Soviet system. They were, quote, enemies of the state and had to be locked up. After these attacks on Israel, a video yeah. came out of Zelensky. He's accusing Russia for what's going on in Israel. Yeah, but it, it's his abuse of cocaine is the only explicit, uh, explanation I can come up with. You, you know, he's panicked. He doesn't know what to do. He's trying to find some way to stay relevant, even though Ukraine as a military force is no longer relevant even though his political leadership is weak and he they held an election in Ukraine today, he probably wouldn't get elected. And one of the examples of his panic and change of approach, he's now wearing different clothes. Remember before he was dressed as Fidel Castro or uh, Che Guevara, you know, with the green fatigues. Now he's going for the Johnny Cash look, all oh, a man in black. He's got all black on. So... You know, he's gotten the message that his old uh, Che Guevara routine is not working anymore. So he's changing it up. And that's, uh, you know, it's it wasn't just I thought it was a one off, but I just heard that today he appeared alongside Stoltenberg and uh, was again, he was the man in black. So we've seen some reports that show that the weapons that were in Poland that were meant to send to Ukraine were sent to Israel. I, I I hadn't seen that, but that must have been today, and that wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, they say, okay, no, this is a bigger pro Israel is a much more important priority now for the United States than Ukraine, period. And Ukraine, the Ukrainians are going to find out they, they made the mistake that others have as well. They trusted the United States. When Whenever you hear the United States, oh, trust us, we got your back. You better get somebody. You better get somebody to guard your back, because you're going to be in trouble. This conflict in Israel gonna be a good sign for negotiations coming out of the Ukraine war, or it's gonna get worse, and the U.S. government gonna double down. No, I think I think it's gonna get worse. I don't see anybody backing off at this point uh, until. Um, there are a couple, a couple of scenarios. Scenario one, uh, the Israeli military storms into the Gaza Strip and is able to overwhelm it fairly quickly, round up Hamas leadership, put the leadership uh, in, in prison or execute them, and then provide humanitarian aid to the uh, Palestinian population, the civilian population. That would... Uh, at least minimize the chance of a broad international reaction. Uh, scenario two is they enter the Gaza Strip and get bogged down because they've blown up so many buildings, tanks can't maneuver, they've created fighting positions for the uh, Hamas forces, and Israel suffers some real uh, casualties in a significant number. And then to compound it, uh, Hezbollah opens up a front up north and out of Syria. So then, you know, you've got you got Israel facing possible defeat, and a real panic was set in then. So I I don't know which of those two you know we'll find out in the coming days. Uh, I'm sure there's a middle ground in there somewhere that they will each side will get enough killed and wounded, and they'll finally come to a negotiation. And it'll probably, I wouldn't be surprised to see China get the lead on that. But, uh, you know, I, I doubt China and or India uh, would be the most likely candidates. Uh, Russia has uh, some issues with, with uh, Israel because of Israel's role in supplying uh, support to Ukraine. So uh, Russia may be holding that against uh the Israelis. This leadership in Palestine, do they have any control of these groups like Hamas? No, no. Uh, 
Mahmoud Abbas, I believe, is the head of uh, the, Pal the, the Palestinian Authority. And they've got no control. They, they don't co control the finances. They don't control the uh, supply of weapons, supply of food, supply of electricity. Uh, so Hamas, you know, discounts them. It's unfortunate that Hamas killed all those kids at that dance because that makes it impossible for the moderates who wanted to find a negotiated solution with Palestine to come out and advocate it because the politicians, the political winds have shifted that even some of the most liberal anti Bibi Netanyahu people in the country are calling for blood, calling for revenge. So that is, uh, you've got a unity government that right now makes it almost impossible for anybody to come out and advocate a peaceful solution to this.